we'll get you'll the important ex- bits. You'll have to excuse me. I tend to speak bluntly. Right, here we go. So um, hopefully colleagues can see that. I will just put it on presentation mode. Uh, so clinical stewardship, the keystone in integrated planning for health systems. And I just wanted to kick off with the first slide and then I'm going to hand over immediately to Tim. Uh, just to give us a bit of a perspective on how we might see planning now and how uh, how would we want this to evolve or what would we want it to evolve into and what would good look like? And there's been, um, I've done a few surveys recently uh, and it's only a smattering, but there's been quite a lot of consistency in what colleagues have said back to me really about planning and my own experience of planning through through my career really. Um, so, and that that flavour has been essentially, you know, the siloed nature of planning, the uh, the lack of um, joining up across the system, the lack of real evidence base that sometimes goes into, it, and the repeating of um, of those processes, and uh, and and for it not to be really driver based or population based. Largely, it's built on Excel sheets, so there's a real sort of management of the process issue and a logistical issue that becomes really stressful at this time of year. There's huge amounts of business cases that are flying around within organisations, not necessarily great controls on those business cases, and they're not managed during the year in terms of understanding what's been approved, what's what's in the pipeline, what the full year effects of those business cases are. And therefore, really understanding what commitments are already already there as a baseline. And then if you overlay that, you've then got the overlaid requirements from the ICS's national policy and direction, as well as looking at the real opportunity to improve services. So taking that baseline, understanding the baseline, understanding the pressures that are already there, then overlaying the actual ambition and requirements is something at the moment that that colleagues are finding very a very difficult job to do uh, and to do um, well and to do in a really efficient way. So if we describe that old world as being sort of, you know, largely top top down target driven, but also very organisational basis and quite a sort of stressed view of that, not necessarily a positive view about how planning is done and very much largely done on Excel, then what would the new world look like? What could that new world look like, which is much more collaborative? You know, it's based, it's enabled, it's agile and it's risk managed and risk based and it's based on evidence and intelligence. So hold that thought as we go through this presentation about, you know, and I'm really interested. I can't see the chat box I'm presenting at the moment, but I'll um, I'll stop in a minute and I'll have a look at the chat. Um, because I think Alison, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt again, but people, ca- people can't see the slides at the moment. Um, right. I don't know what, what's happened, but um, I'm just looking okay. at the chat box now. You can't see the slides, okay? That's not good, is it? Let me see if I can share again. Can you see that? No, no. Well, unfortunately, somebody else is going to have to share the slides then because I can't share my slides yeah. if that's not working. Yeah. Uh, oh. Can you see them? That's it. They've come up now. They've come up now. I must have been sharing the wrong thing. OK, thank you. Sorry. So uh, thankfully, we've not got too far into the presentation. So um, effectively. I've spoken about, um, you know, what that what that new world could look like and the opportunity as we go through this conversation. So effectively, the slide really just is just an overlay uh, to the conversation that I've done. So if I can introduce now uh, my colleague, Tim Wilson, um, and I'll work the slides if that's okay with you, Tim, or if, or if you're happy to take over, but over to you. That's brilliant, no, thanks very much. Um, so um, I think the key thing, you know, and, and many of you have heard this from me or others, uh, we really are, although this is not meant to be a major reorganisation of the NHS, this is a major reorganisation of the NHS. And, you know, we're heading what Muir Gray and I often refer to as the third era. 
So, you know, when the NHS was founded, it was regionally organised. It was, uh, you know, we had 11 regions. Why do we have 11 regions? Because there were 11 teaching hospitals, provincial teaching hospitals um, uh, outside of London. Um, you know, so it was it was a, a, a bureaucracy and it worked extraordinarily well. It was pretty efficient uh, or pretty effective for what it was meant to do. But of course, as healthcare got more and more complex uh, and so on, that bureaucracy started to strain. And... Um, so in the early 90s, uh, Ken Clark and Margaret Thatcher introduced the market. They thought, you know, that actually a choice competition uh, and the purchase provider split would, uh, um, would, would you know, be benefit. So we had the first trust being formed. We have, of course, had famously a GP fund holding, uh, which you, some of you will look back on and with different memories. And... Um, uh, and so forth. But in, in, in the 2000s, obviously, Tony Blair and Alan Milburn really put the purchase provider split on steroids. Uh, and then, you know, we will all be familiar with, you know, we we went through various iterations, didn't we? PCGs, PCTs, CCGs, and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Really, what we've just seen is probably one of the most transformative things. And this is this move to a system. It's a recognition that actually, um, markets are not very effective in healthcare, and there are a lot of reasons for that and the economists con and economists could talk uh talk you through that in particular um you know especially if you look at the work of someone like oliver williamson but if, if we're moving to a system what on earth is a system and the answer is is it's a set of interconnected activities with a common aim OK, so there, if you think of, you know, an integrated care system sitting underneath an ICB, you've got acute trusts, you've got community providers, you've got mental health trusts, you've got general practices or PCNs, you've got uh, the th third sector and so on. You've got all these different bits. They're all in connect interconnected activities, say, delivering mental health or delivering cardiac or care to people with heart conditions. Um, but what they need is a common aim. Next slide, please, Alison. Um, now, that uh, aim has come here. This is a slightly, I just want to reinforce that that aim has come in the Health and Care Bill, which came out last summer. Uh, and here it is written in black and white. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Alison, uh, it, it's more, more written in more plain English. And it is this triple aim. It is the legal duty, as shown on the bill in the prior previous slide, of anybody in the NHS to deliver on these things. When you're making a decision, when you are planning, you must think of these three. OK, when you're planning, you have to think of these three. Are you doing are you trying to achieve these three aims? Theory of someone wanted and said, hang on, I've looked at these plans and I don't think it's it is uh, addressing aim one. You could do uh, it someone could take you take you to judicial review so this is a legal duty but actually if you look at it why wouldn't you want to do these things why don't we of course in the nhs we want to improve the health and well-being of people that's what we come to work to do and we want to we want to in that regard reduce inequalities in health and well-being and you know the nhs was founded on the basis on the basis of need, need not the ability to pay equity has been at the heart of healthcare, so equitable access to high quality healthcare is exactly what we all want to do. So it, it, it's all very well this being a law, but actually, if you look at this and you talk to any any room of people, I was in a room in Essex yesterday talking to people about this, and they said, you know, they they buy into this, they like this, and then obviously there's the final bit about using NHS resources efficiently and sustainably. Are we using those resources to achieve the first two aims, or are we using them in other ways? Next slide. Sorry, next slide. Let's see if I can take control. Hang on. OK, now what's the background to, 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 to all of this? Um, well, we, prior to COVID, we had falling life expectancy. You know, it wasn't good. Um, for the first time in a century, perhaps, life expectancy was part of starting to fall. And in particular, in people from more deprived backgrounds. Inequity was worse, which might be one of the causes. So if you, if you looked at something like um, uh, if you looked at something like um, general practice, uh, the number of GPs in more deprived areas of uh, are falling and they're in, whereas they're staying static 
risk in uh, wealth areas. We appear to be performing badly against international measures and we were missing our own self-imposed targets. Let's just see if this works. Uh, uh, I, mm, how do I get? Oh, yes, there we go. Sorry. Um, now, uh, um, underneath all this is obviously this constant gap. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm mucking this up, aren't I? Alison, you may maybe I'll stop control and go back to you. So underneath all this is this con this gap between um, need and demand. I mean, you're all very familiar with this. You, you know this. You live with this every day. So um, uh, sorry, but it's a gap between need and demand and resources. We never have enough resources. Now, often that is characterised around money, but actually the, the resource that we're shortest of at the moment is workforce. We just haven't got the clinical workforce we need. Um, but sometimes, of course, people talk about carbon and that will probably get increasingly common over the next five to 10 years. But, you know, whatever happens, the need and demand outstrips um, uh, the resources we have. Next slide. So, Alison, I think you're back in control. I think, I hope. There we go. Ah, there we go. And then next slide, please. Thanks. Now, uh, I heard Chris uh, Hobson on the uh, radio this morning. Oh, so previous slide. Uh, Chris Hobson on the radio this morning, and he um, was saying, oh, the problem is it's ageing. We've got an ageing population. That's what's causing the trouble. Well, when you actually look at the data, age, yeah, ageing is an issue. There, are, there is an ageing population, but that's not the main cause of rising demand. The main cause of rising demand is the relentless increase in the volume and intensity of clinical practice. OK, that demand that may come from patients asking for more, although they only ever ask for more because clinicians tell them it's worthwhile. But it's clinicians doing more and more and more. That can come in many different forms. It might be, you know, we're now spending close on a billion pounds on novel on, on new um, oral anticoagulants. We're heading up to half a billion on SGLT2 inhibitors. These are drugs that just didn't exist a few years ago, and yet they've added one and a half billion to our, our demand uh, requirements. Um, three weeks ago, NICE, you know, a, 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 an expert clinical committee at NICE determined that we should drop uh, the threshold for statins from 20% uh, to 5% for primary prevention. This added 15% to general practice workload overnight, 15%. If 15 million more people are going to require statins, that will add 20, 30 million more consultations. Um, so, but I'm not aware that general practice suddenly had 15% extra capacity, but there it came. And that's what's in that blue segment there. It's all these new things and stuff we add to it. None of this stuff is bad or, or, you know, treating more people's statins, of course, may be a good thing. But are you as planners? Have you started to cut back on your workforce requirements for cardiologists? Because that's what the it'll be predicated on. It'll say fewer people have heart disease. Therefore, we can start to close hospital wards and so on. It just never happens, though, of course. Next slide, please. The, the reason in part why it happens is healthcare is a complex adaptive system. So we're not planning some linear process we you know it's it, it, it's not straightforward sure some elective pathways are linear but most things are much more uh, and, and the vast bulk of the work we do in the NHS 90 percent is around um is part of a complex adaptive system which means that planning is very difficult because you're uh, you, you can't always be certain what you're planning for and so forth so even my background here if you like the met office is trying to plan what the weather is going to look like by using predictive models and the people are trying to plan what they do based on that a few days out they can go but as you know weather forecasts um, uh, get increasingly unreliable I promise you it's going to be warmer in July than it is in December, but I can't tell you precisely what the weather's going to be like. And healthcare is not unlike that. It is very hard to plan because you don't precisely know what's going to happen. Uh, none of you, I suspect, in your last year's plans had nice dropping the guide, nice dropping the threshold from 20 to 15, 20 to 5 percent. And yet, as I say, it's had a major impact on general practice workload and therefore 111 and therefore on A&E. Next slide. 
So integrated system planning. So how do you plan for a system as opposed to uh, for a um, uh, you know an, an institution or a department or a team? Because when you get to system, it starts to get complex. Well, I think the first thing is you know when we're planning for a system. Clearly, the planning has to be done by everybody. You can't do this in silos. So any system planning has to have everybody in the room, anybody who's dealing with, with the system. Uh, and therefore, you need to uh, think about the uh, all parts of it. But the point is, there are, you know, there is, there is a hierarchy of things that need to be considered. Next slide, Alison. Um, we would yeah, go to the next slide, actually, after that. We would suggest that you know, one way that this is manageable, because again, planning for a whole system is just too big a bite, is to plan by populations, population groups. Uh, the previous slide was showed you the NHS England approach to population segment, Bridges to Health, which we reckon is probably the best population segmentation model out there. Lots of models are out there, I will tell you, they all have their flaws. Bridges to Health is the best, uh, in our opinion. But to connect up strategic planning with operational planning, you need something in between. I've seen so many plans from ICBs and others where you have these lofty strategic worthwhile aims, not always reflecting the triple aim, which troubles me. But that, so those those lofty aims around strategic goals and so on should be the triple aim. But they somehow then just leap to the operational planning without any really thought through and without any understanding that actually you've got this complex system operating in between. So one of the approaches we're taking at is is this, is this the, the, the factor which we think can fit between strategic planning and operational planning called population stewardship groups. These are groups notably containing clinicians who have the duty and are held accountable for um, uh, delivering on the strategic planning uh, goals and outcomes and measures and helping the operational planners turn one into the other and actually being part of that whole process rather than just doing their own thing in isolation. Next Tim, slide, just Alice. a bit of a time check, so we'll need Yeah, to... that's fine. I think, I think I'm pretty yeah. much there. At that. In fact, I think it's over to you, in fact, now. So next slide, Alison, it's yours. So I think we've covered that. And um, again, you, you, you know, this is reinforcing the opportunity for us to to work in population groups. And I think there's a link here with the with the programme leadership. What you often find is that there are there's programmes, uh, priority programmes that are organised nationally. Uh, they have national directors for a particular programme objective, and it tends to be cascaded through the regions and then cascaded down into um, local uh, priorities then. So it's important that we get that top down link with national programme priorities as well as linking with the population priorities that are aligned with that through your uh, local understanding and regional understanding of what, what those priorities are. And uh, I'm just going to finish off quite quickly here. So just to just to really reinforce uh, the opportunity for us to work end to end really with this. And it's a complex, as, as Tim has said, it's a complex system, lots of organisations in it. And the opportunities as a, an integrated care system to galvanise those different layering of organisations working together across um, a population group is going to need some governance across these layers and that governance needs to be thought about in terms of whether that's at a place level, whether it's going to be um, at a programme level uh, for a population group, whether it's going to be at a regional sub regional level um, where many uh, there's a clustering of ICSs that are coming together to look at those sort of sub regional regional level issues. The point I wanted to finish off with here was the opportunity for us to really, really look at this in terms of drivers. Um, and so when we're looking at the population group that we might be um, considering for a really big priority um, improvement in our strategic plan, we'll look at it across these three main areas of improvement, outcomes, equity of access, efficiency, but also social value. We'll set objectives, really smart objectives around what we want to see and what does success look like in terms of that improvement. 
And then we'll follow that through in terms of a dry, usually using driver diagrams to then look at, well, what actually would would be the main impact if we were trying to reduce or improve any of these key outcomes? What would we need to do? So in this example, I've said, you know, if you're going to reduce mortality, earlier diagnosis of a condition, and then you move over to the right hand side and the, and the more you get into the drivers, and the more you get into the resources needed to, de to deliver that, the more you're getting into operational planning. And then you move to the right hand side of this process, moving from your up from your um, population outcomes, equity of access and efficiency and really driving that through to what are the actual drivers you need to change? What are the uh, interventions you then need to put in place uh, to make that happen? Um, and then taking it through by year. So year one, two, three, four, and actually then turning it into a departmental um, analysis. And within each department, you've got all of your different resource framing. So workforce technology, uh, you've got things like capacity, estates, um, looking at whether you're getting good value from your uh, utilisation of your workforce. So taking that through and across from that strategic to the operational plan, is is really this beauty of connected planning because you're taking it through to the operational plan drivers and assumptions that link you back to that population outcome that you're looking to influence and you'll be looking at it from capacity demand uh, finance workforce etc there's a long list of resource elements that you'll be looking to assemble in your operational plan that will make a difference here. And I think later on, we're going to touch on the workforce element within an example of um, how you would go about looking at a workforce, understanding what baseline you have, and then overlaying the interventions that you're looking to make to make that difference. In this example, outpatients, uh, we want a workforce model for outpatients. So do we understand the retirements, the attrition, what new trainees are coming in? What's the opportunity for changing the skill mix? Um, what's the impact of patient initiated follow up technology, et cetera, which will then lead you to understanding what capacity you've got, but then also leading you back through the um, population lens as to, you know, what can we then do to uh, be able to see more patients from particular deprived groups or underserved groups, which will then help in terms of that access. So um, th hopefully that's a sort of quick uh, presentation on on the drivers. I'm just trying to move the slides down. Oops, I think that's it for for this segment. So I'm going to stop presenting. And hopefully that's a good segue now for Nick, I think, who's on next to talk about perhaps another industry. But again, this opportunity of linking strategic to operational and the, the connected planning elements. Thank you. Yeah, all, all good. And thank you very much, Alison and Tim. Yeah, for those of you that don't know me, so Nick Carter, I'm a director in the Deloitte Consulting Practice. I lead uh, Connected Planning as an offering. Um, and I think Alison and Tim, you know, some of the things I was writing down you were going through in terms of you know interconnected activities, making sure we're using NHS resources efficiently and sustainably. These are the, the antithesis in terms of the objective as to what we want to try and achieve in terms of joining the dots together in terms of some of these plans. So um, I think we're definitely on the right track. Um, can I just double check? Is my video coming through? And, and Yes, screen? we can oh, see you. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so maybe just a quick background, and I think this will set the stage in terms of the example that I picked. So you know, my um, background, Tim, as you were mentioning, so I'm actually an economist by trade. And really, for those of you that have spent any time you know, reading anything around economics, the whole premise is is understanding cause and effect and that the economy has got these things where things are interconnected. So you know, if we make a decision in one part of the business or one trust, there is an impact in another part, which, you know, whether it's a significant one or a minor one. But these relationships are absolutely present. And you know, when you're trying to you know, make sure that all of the resources are used efficiently and sustainably, you need to understand what the interconnected nature is 
And without understanding that, you're kind of, you know, working in the dark a little bit. You, you don't know whether you're creating, a, you know, an optimal situation, whether you're optimizing the workforce, whether you're optimizing your inventory, or whether you might have, you know, different um, buffers or inefficiencies in there. So, you know, we spend a lot of time, um, and myself personally, you know, designing and implementing systems um, for whether it's public sector, private, or also financial services organizations to kind of capture this value. Um, and one thing I would say is that the, the problem that we're solving for is very consistent regardless of the industry. It's really trying to make sure that we can generate value from being better prepared, you know, whether it's the demand and supply or, um, you know, kind of al aligning those different bits those different aspects. So, um, you know, very relatable. Um, I have just returned, you know, a year ago from, from living in Australia uh, for six years. Um, and that's, you might get a hint around the, the example that I've chosen to walk you through. Um, and ultimately, it, it's a parallel organisation um, but before before we jump into that, just to kind of level set. So, you know, in terms of what we mean by connected planning, I think Alison, you got a, a great overview, and, and Tim, I think being able to kind of link that back to some of the challenges you've got around, you know, how do you have an initiative in one part of the the, the NHS that impacts the other, but then try and capitalise on that gain. Um, and really, what we see is. Typically, there's a lot of siloed planning. So if you're making a decision, people do it in their own area. You know, if you're short on time as well, you know, and you don't have the right systems and processes, then it takes a lot of time to be able to connect the dots manually. And if you can't do that, then you're going to kind of just work in one area. So, you know, if you're trying to forecast, um, for example, the number of you know patients that are coming in and you're trying to align that with bed capacity, but you don't really have a view of you know what's happening in terms of the ambulance service, in terms of other external factors you will use things like history you'll make assumptions but those assumptions may not be as accurate as they can which means that you're you know getting close to a, a kind of losing battle really because you don't have all the information to make the right decision um, and a lot of the the manual processes you know excel is a fantastic tool uh, it launched 35 years ago. Um, I've got some really old magazines around when it came out saying it was going to solve the world. And it is a fantastic tool that everyone knows really well. And that is an advantage. But the challenge you've got is that, you know, getting accurate um, single source of truth where it's reliable and connected to join the dots with, with other people in your um, in, in your trust or you know, in, in colleagues. There are significant limitations, let's be honest. So, um, you know, we see this time and time again, um, things not joining together. Um, and therefore, the decisions that you're going to make based on that, um, you know, are obviously going to be suboptimal and they often require uh, heroic efforts. And what I mean by heroic efforts, it means you know, long hours. It means being able to do lots of manual work that a person is doing rather than a computer can do. And I think if, if any of you, and I'm sure you can relate to this, you know, have got the drive for, you know, efficient ways of working where you use resources well and that you use your time well and you don't have to work you know late nights or do you know challenging uh, hours to be able to just get to a number that you think at the end is maybe you know 70 percent accurate rather than could be a little bit more it's really using technology as well as new processes to be able to leverage that and you know Alison and the team are, are really on to something here I think you know we've we've as Deloitte have implemented over 600 connected planning solutions now we've been doing this for the last nine years specifically with Anaplan um, you know and it is a fantastic enabler it's not the only thing you know the people you guys on the call um, are critical to be able to input into the process. But um, you know, I think with kind of people, the new processes, and then the technology, those are the three tenants really that we see as being critical to, to, to driving this. Um, and ultimately the, the vision that we've got and, and what we kind of realize with our clients in, in varying different maturity levels is trying to pull all of that together so that it is connected. You know, and when you're using um, legacy tools and processes that's really difficult so we we use platforms like anaplan to be able to kind of join those dots together um, and really you know it's only been technically possible in the last kind of eight or nine years and actually the last five or so have had significant um you know drive forward to be able to kind of have this level of sophistication in the system where it's really easy and it's user friendly and it's nice to use um, you know, that's the aim here so that we've actually got the latest information that's accurate and, um, you know, it, 
we've got a high level of confidence. So that kind of integrated data set, you know, being able to, to, to link different parts of the trust and, and obviously from a kind of core systems are critical um, and also kind of having that productivity uplift. So being able to really use your time in the best way. Um, we see that time and time again. And the example that I'll walk you through with Queensland Rail, um, you know, was over 20 percent in terms of the time capacity that they released from the planning process to be able to spend time then on looking at the numbers and the drivers that Alison was mentioning around why is this happening? What can I do to change this in the future? You know, that kind of you know, released capacity is something that, you know, everyone needs oxygen to be able to make, make those decisions. And you know, we often see that the day to day, we're kind of starving ourselves from the oxygen to actually have that time. Um, and then the last bit really around the kind of future state is, you know, having the, the what if modeling. I mean, it's great to come up with a plan. I know you guys are you know, in the midst of, of, of producing plans at the moment. And I think being able to actually ask questions around, well, what if this changed? To what we, we think this is coming. What if this happened? How would it impact, you know, our capacity, our workforce, our finances, our funding? Um, you know, how is it all connected? And I think being able to kind of link those together in a way where you've got the, the domino effect of changing one assumption or a drive and then seeing it play through as a scenario, that's really the capability that we see our clients needing to be able to you know, efficiently and sustainably use resources, you know, whether it's for the NHS or whether it's whether it's for our colleagues in the private sector. Um, so that's a quick kind of level set around what we mean. And I guess in terms of some of the value and, and the story um, that I'll tell you, and I mentioned I've spent six years in Australia recently, um, you know, one of the organisations that Deloitte worked with was one that, um, you know, many of uh, my colleagues and my family use every single day, and this was Queensland Rail. And the reason why I picked Queensland Rail is because they're not a health organisation, but they do have a very complex shift orientated you know government transport um, structure which i think is, is a parallel to the nhs and i think we, you know there was 50 million kind of client interactions each year which really is an opportunity for you know us to either satisfy the need and be able to deliver great service um, or actually mean that you know you ruin someone's day or obviously in the nhs it's even even worse than that in terms of what the implications can be um, and those kind of high level of public service interactions were then in a context of you know, increasing re uh, regulatory pressure. There was increasing competition and the scrutiny and the exposure um, that they were getting was was incredibly high. And I think that those are that's very similar to the environment that we're in at the moment in the UK um, with the with the health service. And I think you know having spent you know many many years there um, and then seeing the kind of government say that the state of the planning within the National Rail Organization was actually subpar and there was an inquiry into planning and around demand planning, skill set, workforce um, that was incredibly public that Deloitte was immediately kind of called in to be able to help, help support the transformation and the improvements on. Um, we really saw what the impact was and it's not just an impact on a private organization thinking around, oh, it's lower profit. It's actually significant impact on the welfare and the ability for people to move to see relatives, get to work. It was, it it was a really significant um, challenge. And I think that you know, really the, the, the first problem they were looking at was around workforce and how do they predict the demand, but also the supply, which it, you can't just click your fingers and have engineers and have proficient staff, you know, similar to, you know, training doctors and nurses. There's, of course, a pool on standby, but to make a systemic change, a long term change, we need to be able to predict the future and have confidence in it to be able to then support investment. Um, so so when we worked with um, Queen's Rail, what we did is we effectively worked through the challenge around how do we reduce the time that they're spending on planning to give them that oxygen to understand what the drivers are. Um, we then built trust within the teams. So specifically uh, between uh, HR, the business unit teams, finance, and that was more of a kind of ways of working. And that comes back to the kind of processes and the process improvement bit, which is fundamental. You know, a great system is one thing, but if it, if it's founded on a poor process, it will still be a beautiful system that doesn't work and doesn't fit the purpose. And I think, again, this is why you know, your type of contributions and I think um, you know expertise from others in the industry um, are able to kind of shape what that best practice process looks like. So it's a bit more of a, a kind of streamlined approach. 
Um, and then what we did is we we proactively worked with um, the teams to be able to look at supply, demand trends, support the decision making, and effectively then go through how they can hire enough engineers and proactively partner with external firms to be able to close the gap in terms of skill set and workforce, and also innovate with apprentice programs to be able to make sure that was a long term sustainable future. So, you know, the number of scenarios that we had to run through for that was incredible because obviously there are so many levers you can pull or drivers you can play with um you know, having one platform and one system to be able to do that in total you know was was, was crucial um and and the outcome really was that you know Queens and Rail were, were not only able to plan more effectively. Um, if you do a, a Google, I mean, sure, you'll you'll see the report and kind of how where they're at now, which is a marked improvement around where where they were previously doing. And the benefit really here was that they had um, you know real insights now into how they can better serve the population, but also they had the oxygen to be able to understand the drivers and the plans going forward so that they weren't having to do those heroic efforts, but actually they could um, have the right information to be able to understand signals that were happening, understand the demand signals. And Tim, I think you were mentioning akin to weather. And I really like that analogy because you know it's going to, you know, there's seasonality, but in terms of, you know, the near term, you really need to monitor those signals. And, um, you know, we were looking at those signals in terms of you know, transport, in terms of population growth, and, you know, those things to factor them into a plan, you need a, a, a platform and a capability that is sophisticated enough to do that, where the person doesn't, you know, every single person doesn't have to do that themselves. Um, so that's kind of how, how, how we moved forward together. Um, so to, to briefly walk you through the, the journey that they went on, and, and I would say every journey of, um, of an organisation when it comes to connected planning is, is different, but I think the one um, with Queens and Rail is, is, is probably quite similar to some of the challenges that, that, that some of you in the room, virtual room, might be trying to tackle first. So um, the first really was around workforce. So, you know, gaining that visibility and the future demand and the, and the forecast for supply for the critical workforce groups was really like an operational challenge. So it was very tactical. It was in the detail. It was taking rostering. It was taking schedules. It was optimising those to be able to get um, to get the right answer. So that they started with the, the, the biggest challenge, but also the one that would deliver the most amount of value. But, but ultimately, then the question comes down to you know, how are we using the resources efficiently and sustainably? So the, the financials and the funding concept behind that was crucial to understand, well, what if we did this? What if we made this decision? Then what would be the financial impact? So, you know, the next part after that was actually moving into what we call planning, budgeting, forecasting. So it's kind of linking those planning processes so that you had a model that was connected using the different um, allocations and aggregations um, so that it kind of pulled together into one place. Um, and, and, and that connected nature had analytics across workforce, across financials, and it had scenario planning as well. So it's all connected together. Um, and then after we tackled the operational aspects, we then moved up into that kind of longer term, you know, five year, 10 year plan to be able to have a sustainable perspective holistically. And this could be, you know, not just at a trust level, it could be at an ICS level, for example, at a national level, you know, being able to join these things together and get, um, you know, marginal gains by the efficiency between these things working well. You know, that's ultimately what they wanted to get by all the different train routes, all the different parts of the state, and being able to, to run those drivers to be able to understand, you know, what, what can be the, the value on um, supply chain, on logistics, on inventory, um, you know, how can we optimise the funding that we've got available to get the best outcome for our customers, for our, for our passengers. Um, and ultimately, you know, that, that meant that the outcome was, you know, we removed you know, hundreds of Excel workbooks. We adopted a standardised process that was agreed um, nationally as a best in class process. So it wasn't something where everyone needed to come up with their own way. It was actually something where we took government guidance and subject matter input to craft that process that was best in class. Um, and ultimately the reduced effort from the planning meant that actually there was greater visibility and understanding around what are those drivers and you know, the impact on if there's a change in policy, then actually what does that mean on, on our trust, you know, our part, our part of the organization? Um, 
And then the last bit is really looking forward. So, you know, as we were talking about those different connected use cases, you know, it doesn't stop with just workforce or just finance or just strategic planning. You know, there are there are tens of different synergies that we get from looking across a different business or organization where you know we can optimize. I know obviously you know, inventory stocks, ordering, PP equipment, you know, there's a lot of a lot of different things in there that I think would would really benefit. And you know, I think you guys are, are hopefully excited about some of the demos that you'll see coming up because I think that's a snippet around what it could look like. Um, I will um, pause there. I'm happy towards the end to take any questions yeah. and throw them in the chat. Um, and well, I'll let's, put, let's yeah. use the chat if we can, Nick. That would be ace. And it, we'll try and squeeze a little bit of time. Please hang around. We'll try and squeeze a little bit of time. So if you've got any questions, we'll put them in the chat and then I'll bring you in. If there's a question that's put in the chat, I'll bring you in so that yeah. you can ask, ask it yourself in a, in a minute. That would be fab. Thank you. So uh, we'll now move on. We've got Dave uh, David Webb, who's... Uh, joined us from uh, South Central Ambulance uh, Trust and um, is, I'm just going to get your title right, Dave, it's Director of Performance and... Oh, no, I'm not. You've promoted no. me, Alison. I don't oh, mind. God, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> good morning all. Um, my, uh, my role is Head of Performance Forecasting, um, so I do report to the uh, Planning Performance Forecasting Director um, and work within that directorate. Perfect. So, yes. Over to you, Dave. Tell us Thank you story. very much. No problem. Um, so yeah, what I'd like to really talk about today is um, at South Central Ambulance Service, how we've sort of um, looked at integrated planning um, and our methodology. I'll talk a little bit about process, people and systems, software and integration. Um, it's it's a good segue actually, you know, looking at um, how Nick presented. This is sort of an, another real user case, if you like, of, of that implementation um, and the ability to join everything up. But um, I'll run through now. I do warn you, and um, I did say to us in the early in the week, this is quite a, um, a slide heavy presentation, but really what I, some of the slides are just um, touch points, etc. And then, you know, I'll take questions respectfully at the end. Um, but yeah, do strap yourselves in. Um, so really from from our organization you know let's talk about um how we got there in terms of system and process so um the the directorate the plan directorates uh, was introduced in 2015 originally so before that planning was sort of a you know a dark car in the cupboard it wasn't sort of stage uh, center stage for the organization so um but the effectiveness of your planning is is that enabler for your service delivery um, so, you know, it's a real key to um, take the planning, centralise the scheduling function um, and, and give it the platform focus and support that needed to, to make that improvement. Um, we changed our workforce system, so we aligned with the rest of the Ambulance Trust in 2016 and moved away from an in, embedded uh, commercial application to the world of GRS. Um, that gave us the ability to look at demand gap plan and modelling, which I'll talk about, or to make self-service, you know, good good function for end users, et cetera. We integrated then a, a, a workforce platform called Skillstream. Um, we created APIs across the two. That gave us the ability to manage um, bank staff, in particular in flexible resources, but also give us really good, strong financial governance around uh, PP provision, or private provider provision, but also clinical compliance for all of that flexible workforce. Um, we then, from 2019, as part of the original GDE funding, uh, we implemented our first um, phase one of the Anaplan project. So we went out to uh, tender um, nationally, looked at a couple of options, and we picked Anaplan as our preferred partner at that point. Um, so what was our journey, really? That's really got us to where we are today, 2018, 2019. Um, we went out to re-procurement, so the contract for our workforce system um, came to an end. We went out nationally for a procurement. Um, we did look at a couple of other options, but um, you know we've solidified our, our long-term contract with our current preferred um, GRS Total Mobile partner um, and really the goal was to look at you know next steps in terms of workforce systems and planning so really looking at a single integrated workforce system able to do all of those things move from a on-premise to a, a SaaS environment um, be able to fully integrate timesheets including you know integration to payroll time and attendance um, and you know delivering uh, good governance around working time directives, work hours, flexible working, you know uh, auto rostering, preference based scheduling, and giving us the ability to look at the contract KPIs. 
So how does the directorate stand internally? So we've got quite a small team. We have centralised our scheduling department uh, within the trust. Um, we've got a planning and forecasting team. And then we've got some support structures around those two. So the workforce planning, um, the bank and agency management and the prior provider provision. You know, that's that's quite a chunky element in terms of overall process, um, in terms of contract management and tendering, etc. But in terms of just managing uh, supply. Um, we've then got underneath that, underpinning that, the system admin and compliance team. So that's around system development, process, configuration, housekeeping, compliance, data accuracy. So you can sort of see there, there's three, you know, there's areas that look at three key things. And it's stuff that Nick was respectfully just talking about. So, you know, demand, capacity, supply, um, and, and how we understand those. So we look at our demand. Um, this is a bit, um, Probably we, it's quite granular, but it gives you an idea of how we plan. You know that that whole structure of how we um, have a methodology for uh, service delivery and how we measure that. You know that feeds into all of our planning, strategic views, our short-term planning, our finance, our workforce. This is really sort of where we start. So. Um, we look at the number of responses. So we talk about demand and forecasting. We look at. Um, task time so um, you know every unit of uh, work whether it's a, uh, a an ambulance response whether it's a, um, a AHT for a call handler so average handling time for volume of calls we've got an hour of demand that's produced by that calculation we then feed demand into our unit hours um, and that gives us a utilization so you know if you've got uh, 50 hours of demand and uh, 100 units hours your utilization is 50 percent so we use utilization. It's it's an output of the model, but actually in terms of regression, it gives you a really good fundamental uh, baseline for forecasting, reporting um, and performance itself. So the variables that then play into that as, as part of that process is then looking at the drivers underneath. So demand fluctuations, resource fluctuations in terms of amount of resource you've got and those processes that then also drive into that utilization. And it's and it's a continuing revolving circle. You know, we continue to review, uh, tune and hone our process. Um, that gives you the ability then from a very high level to look at forecasting. So good solid regression modeling gives us the ability to predict where we're going to be. It gives you the ability then to, to try and tune the workforce models and play through what if scenarios, etc. Um, that's a you know, quick snapshot. I did say some of these slides are real touch point, but it gives you an idea. We're able to then look at our actual outturn, our run rates, our three month and 12 month, our year to date data sets. You can look at changes in prediction. You can look at the um, the accuracy of your prediction and, and, and reported actuals. So you can see, you know, for our CAT 9, we were in three seconds, um, you know, and, and our, most of our regression models are, um, you know, significantly 0.9 or above in terms of correlation. So, you know, we're fairly comfortable. Um, Pre-pandemic, things were a lot easier. Post-pandemic, it's been a little bit more challenging and stochastic, but, you know, our, our baseline core principles of how we model are fairly, um, fairly good. Um, so let's talk about managing supply. Um, so strategically, you know, the, uh, you, we've got a strategic plan. So again, Nick talked about this, you know, that long term workforce plan takes three years to to create a paramedic. Um, so, you know, we need to look at that, that strategic three to five year plan. Um, and every time you might do that annually and that changes, I'll talk you through the golfing analogy. This wasn't um, my my idea in terms of deliverables. I don't like golf, um, if I'm honest. It ruins a good walk, as they say, but there you go. Um, so we've got an operational process where we look at our forecast. We talked about utilization model. That gives you the amount of hours that you require to deliver performance at service level. We then look at our education. So that supply, the recruitment, the ability to train the capacities for university, um, you know, so all of those things play into that pipeline. Do you, you know, what is your requirement? Have you got the capacity to 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 bring in and train and and, and upskill? Um, we then move on to our workforce. So we then plan what our workforces um, are going to be in terms of work effective numbers because you've got new starter pathways, training pipelines, attrition, retention, 
um, and staff in post against establishment. So all those things are worked through um, integrated workforce planning and we've got an integrated workforce board. And then finally, we, pl we play that through into the finances. So the abstraction rates, the output staff hours, whether there's a gap in our own provision and what we might need to do around our PP provider provision and tendering and contract, and ultimately what the what it means to budget. So you are, you know, historically we've been on a tariff based income. So we've been fairly able to flex resources against our demand forecast and know, um, be confident that the income's there to match. Um, as we move outside of the COVID funding, you know, this year we're going to be fairly constrained with budget and ultimately we're able to then review the model from a from a from a ceiling of, of finance through envelopes as opposed to a you know an income position. So we can tune the model and Nick was talking about that. We can look at the model in multiple different ways and tune the outputs. Um, so that gives us a long term plan. We've got our forecast hours, our forecasted workforce, forecast our abstractions, and we look at our supply. That gives us a weekly output. So we do that for every week of the year. We plan at a weekly level, we predict for us at a weekly level, and we resource. Um, you know, and our short term forecasting and our short term relief planning cycle operationally is done at a weekly level. So that gives you the ability to look at your workforce plans. And then we can manage our actual. So we set a budget level, what our expected workforce plans are from a workforce um, process. And then we measure that, you know, weekly as a trust. That also gives the ability to set establishment rates. So, you know, in frontline operations, we've got seven operational nodes. The outturn of that workforce uh, management flow gives you the ability to set rosters. So we set establishment, that feeds into rosters. So as part of our three and five year plans, we're looking at forward establishment and rosters. We're moving to a point where we're trying to build a modular roster design where we can effectively bolt on additional rosters as workforce um, establishment enables. And that delivers two benefits. Say you haven't got loads of vacancy and roster lines that, you know, just in efficient terms of planning, but also you don't have to then review your roster process and the pain of going through roster transformations every couple of years with staff, which can be um, unsettling and un unnerving, quite challenging. And then that's finally our integrated workforce planning. So, you know, you can see our recruitment pipelines, the uh, turnover, and that all plays into all those um, aspects as I've discussed. So if we move on to our demand, let's have a look at how we're matching our supply to our demand. Let's look at our supply pipeline. Um, so how do we get to our shift coverage? And this is really now the, the operational process of putting the rostered hours out, putting the right hours out, matching demand, and ensuring that we've got the right match against short-term forecasts so that operationally, we don't just um, outturn to roster, we continually monitor uh, demand and profiling and, tr and make sure that we're resourcing to that profile. So that starts with our shifts. You know, we've got a roster system. We know what the core roster's output. Um, we then look at the impact of our demand. So we've got a short term forecast. We're forecasting continuously, for, you know, um, using different um, algorithms and I'll cover that shortly. That gives us the ability to look at our gaps or any gaps in resource and then we can create shifts through the workforce system. Um, we then use our relief planning process at a five week cycle once we created those shifts. So that's our best opportunity to use the element of relief to get the best match possible. After that, we then advertise vacancies or required shifts out to, to bank and overtime, and we've got tiered publications. We're able to manage that supply. And then finally, any shifts that aren't covered, we can um, share with our private providers on top of their core contracts that they already have in place. And that just really is how we hone that um, process to give us the best outturn. This is um, a graph that's currently on um, our work, uh, fed from workforce system directly into Anaplan. And the objective is obviously to get that aligned, optimise our resource against the requirement, and that gives us the best um, provision to outcomes for the general public in terms of um, experience, uh, service delivery, um, as well as clinical. So let's talk. So, you know, we had a lot of that methodology. What we didn't have was was a proxy to deliver it. You know, so again, Nick talked about the multiple spreadsheets and, you know, we've lived through that pain. Um, originally, we had a lot of this methodology and functionality on Excel shared network drives. You know, some of them were very cumbersome, um, although it was all quite clever. Change control in particular and updating um, and having the latest versions and all of those other challenges, you know, um, was really problematic to the process. So as part of that GD in 2019, we went out to look for how could we use, you know, and go and uh, procure a platform that supports that connective planning and uh, with 
part of the GD funding. Um, we awarded that to Anaplan. We went through that procurement process and Anaplan were our preferred partner. And from 2019, we've developed a um, integrated uh, workforce uh, optimization system on the Anaplan platform itself. Um, and really, you know, our, our initial approach was, you know, we were fairly confident, fairly assured with our own process and methodology. We just weren't happy with the technical solutions that we had. Um, and, you know, our current process, it was considered uh, exemplary within within the sector, but we had, a, you know, numerous pinch points, reliance on spreadsheets, legacy databases, um, and all of those problematic things. So we looked for a platform where we could have a single source optimized uh, solution. We could integrate, so all of our services could be integrated. It would deliver improved efficiency and effect effectiveness of the planning process. So, and, and that goes from everything from that strategic view, being able to connect the what if scenarios, the workforce planning, the finances, um, the, re the recruitment process and the planning process. Also then giving the planners and the schedulers the ability to see almost live data in terms of actually the daily outturn and processes. So we go from this very high strategic view right down to the macro level of 15 minutes uh, uh, scheduling through the system fed by workforce. It gave us the ability to connect our data, our people and our plans together. And that also improves outturn slide decks for execs and, and a lot of um, MI and BI information that comes from our plan as well gave us the ability to look at optimization of our current process, and I'll talk about that. And obviously it builds resilience. So how did we implement it? We had a number of uh, SCAS data sets, everything from um, the CADs and the telephony from our workforce systems, the Skillstream um, ESR and the finance ledger. We built an API, you know, it's a connected API as part of the Anaplan integration. Um, we did uh, two phases of the Anaplan build originally. First phase was the frontline operation. Second phase was the clinical contact center, which includes the 111 and 999 services. We bring information into um, a, a hub and spoke model and that's best, best practice within the Anaplan environment. And then you've got modular based build outs um, outside of your, your main data hub. Um, and we look at everything from the operational models for, for those services, the finance resource models, our plan IQ and statistical models, which enable us to um, uh, embed forecasting and the workforce planning. So they all interconnect. And as you change and, and scenario plan, you know, you can update one element or one element of demand or one element of the process and it feeds and integrates um, and flows through your data process. Just another minute or so, if that's OK, Dave. Yeah, that's Thanks. fine. No problem. So the forecasting, we feed demand from our data warehouse. We put that into our plan, our statistical model. That forecast comes out into the budget process and actually it generates information back to workforce system. So we've got this continuous cycle. Um, that information into the workforce system is refreshed every 50 minutes from the planning process, but it also gives us the ability to create those additional shifts to make sure we're matching demand. It also gives us that, you know, intraday management. So this is a snapshot for CCC. So, you know, I am into the granular detail now, but from a service delivery perspective, we've got tools that enable um, the optimization of staff on a given day um, for best service delivery. Gives us the ability to look at long-term, short-term predictions for performance um, and ops are on the left. Um, uh, contact centers on the right. You can see the, the the accuracy of the top graph, you know, and even the bottom graph where we're predicting forms by hour of day um, and the accuracy that we're currently seeing from that model. Um, and then the last bit was around the additional benefits from uh, forecasting accuracy in the, and um, plan IQ. So there's a number of machine learning models and algorithms that we now use for forecasting. It's improved our overall forecasting accuracy. It wasn't bad to start with, respectfully. Um, we were fairly proud, but 0.1% um, improvements, about £100,000. And we've made about a million pound improvement um, in terms of forecasting accuracy as an absolute percentage error. Um, and then these are all of the benefits. So obviously integrated planning across all systems, improved forecasting accuracy, improved planning process, reducing the need for our prior providers. And that's where the big savings come. Aligns uh, current and future workforce plans with demand and plans and, and the strategic uh, vision of the trust. And it reduces risk associated with talent shortages, et cetera, you know, having that platform. And then very, very quickly, two slides out and left. Integrated system planning, what could the future look like? Anaplan's already looked at a, a model of looking at 
um, capacity within A and E. As an ambulance trust, you know one of our big issues in terms of operational performance is handover. Um, and you could extend the Anaplan model to look at demand and capacity management within an ED department, including you know full patient flow. Um, and they have done some uh, early adaptive models to to help um, look at that information around bed capacity flow. Um, uh, staffing, etc., and that would be a really good way of integrating parts of that process and elements across IUCs, um, where you could look at the overall throughput. We can forecast accurately transport rates into acutes, and acutes could have an accurate then plan around capacity and management around that process. Um, and that's it for me. I um, apologise; it was slide heavy, but hopefully you well found done. It informative. No, that's great. Absolutely. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Um, I think there will be some questions. I'm sure that we'll, um, we'll, we'll try and squeeze a few minutes at the end if we can yes, uh, no for questions. But if there's some in the chat bar, and I think in particular the quantification of the impact was something that really hit home to me. And then building on this whole theme of, you know, how can we release value? How can we help uh, drive productivity, get better accuracy and really use our workforce well. I think just handing over to Francis, I think some of those are some of the themes you're going to pick up in a moment, Francis. So if I can hang over, hand over to you to give us a sort of big picture of uh, planning in the NHS at the minute. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Anderson. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Francis Couturian. I am Director of Operational Finance um, Intervention in the Midlands region and um, seconded from the national team as Deputy Director of Financial Planning. So I'm presenting this probably more from my national role rather than the Midlands role. Um, should there be a presentation? I, I had this awful thing happen last night, which is modern desktop upgrade, which has put everything off my computer, but can I if I just share my own presentation and see yeah. how, we, yeah, how we get away with that? Has that worked? Yep, yes. Yep, yep. it's all good. So I thought I'd just give through um, a run through about all the different documentation um, and we can send these slides out afterwards because there's um, links that you'll be able to click on to get to that relevant guidance. So this is everything that's come out on planning since the 23rd of December up to probably yesterday. I think there's still some updates going through. So this is on all the ICB allocations which are on used on um, future NHS um, and anything else that's come out. So. There's ongoing um, constant fluidity about updates and different allocations. Um, and what is quite interesting, if you haven't noticed, but since probably not last planning around, planning around before, we've tried to really mobilise and use this one stop shop for um, which we've used Nature's Futures to keep all guidance as close into one place as we can. Um, on top of that, we've got templates and supporting tools. So you should have all had all your guidance go through PIFIMS, um, ICS revenue and capital plans um, and ICB details, provided templates include detailed revenue and capital plans and they will flow through to in-year monitoring. System and provided templates are collected at the same time now through the PIFIMS portals and macros in your system templates automatically update um, to extract data from provider templates to try to ensure that the provider and the system templates are now aligned as close as possible before submission. So we too are trying to use technology to try to um, minimise some of those issues that we've seen previously as we start to move into the system reporting arena. So um, we should have brief resubmissions to correct any immediate issues with each submission. And then in addition to that, there's the ICS triangulation tool, which um, looks at the metrics across the alignment of finance, activity, performance and all the workforce plans. Um, we issued it as a functional workforce and activity templates. Um, ICSs are asked to review the triangulation outputs before planning submission. This is quite a step change to um, prior submissions where triangulation came out post um, post submission. So we've tried to uh, get a template that works that you can use before submission comes in. Um, and then we'll reissue after the draft templates, which also includes other national benchmarking data. And um, there's the IC, ICS financial plan assurance tool as well. Um, so obviously we've now got the delegation. So um, in 22-23, the pod delegation take 
place transitionally for the six ICVs in the South East region and Greater Manchester. So non-delegated ICVs in 22-23 have all been approved to take delegation from the 1st of April 2023. So draft allocations supporting the delegation of the pod services were shared with systems in December and these allocations the output of detailed work with regional commissioners. Um, as part of the delegation process it was agreed that staff would also transfer to the ICBs. There is a differential approach to where planning is taking place and um, in planning templates for the six fully delegated systems and those that were delegated in 2023 and those are taking new delegation in 2023-24. Um, the dental budgets are obviously subject to an additional rule, rule and they're being ring-fenced. Ring um, we all know there's some obviously issues with the dental spend at the moment. Um, so delegation of specialised services. So the approach for delegation of specialised services was discussed and agreed at the February NHSE board meeting. This includes the formation of nine statutory joint committees. So they are ready to take on formal joint commissioning responsibility for all 59 services from the 1st of April, which is about £13 billion. So to support the move to delegation, allocations are changing from host provider to population basis in 23-24 and then with full delegation in 24-25 which will be set at the ICB level. Um, a hot topic is obviously the elective recovery fund so reimbursement for elective activity will be on a 100% payment by activity I guess previously known as tariff. Um, this is for elective ordering and day cases, outpatient first and outpatient procedures, not follow-ups, chemotherapy, diagnostic imaging and nuclear medicine. Um, providers will pay tariff prices for each unit of the elective activity. There is no floor or baseline level of activity funding, um, which we have previously, if you remember, about different clawback levels. So that's changed. Each commissioner has set activity target, which is their basis of their EOF allocation. So the targets will be different from each ICB and the level of target will be set based on 22, 23, and then with an incremental increase per month. So each system will have somewhere between 103 and 113 per cent. Commissioners and providers will go back to contract with each other in the usual way. Each contract must set out what level of elective activity the provider is expected to deliver in contributing to the overall ICB activity requirement. You are not, it is not required that you commission at say 103 per cent to all of your providers, it can be differential but overall the system itself has to get back to 103. Um, I should say ICS providers will continue to be funded on a 100% tariff basis. Just a summary of um, timetable, obviously we've had the submission draft one, the next final uh, 30th of March 2023 is due in on Thursday. Um, with contracts agreed and signed, although um, I'm aware that there might be some differing on that because I still don't think we're at a position that plans will be signed off at the national level. Um, I thought I'd then bring in just a few points about the draft plans that have come in so far. Um, this shows you the differential differences we've got going through on the ICS efficiency and that is your provider and your um, ICB efficiency amalgamated between the two or added up to between the two. Um, you can see that overall national, it's about 4.6% of um, allocation, very differential differences between different regions. What you can also see is the step change that is going through from what was reported in 22-23. Um, I just thought I'd point a note as well to of the um, efficiencies that have gone through, you can see that there are significant amount that are still high risk at 50% and only 13.2% is actually fully developed. So I think that starts to call in, um, I guess, the deliverability of that for 23, 24 for month one. And then I think it's probably really worth talking about this whole productivity thing, which I think is for me, the angle about the ERF and how we um, maximize our ERF payments as well across the national um, and by system. So you can see overall some of the argument is that people that especially at national level were having that actually after adjusting for inflation since 1920 um, we've actually spent 10.5 percent additional um, or above 
1920 levels, but overall we are delivering 0.2% um, less activity on a cost weight activity basis. Um, and if you see like for Midlands, for example, we are spending 12.5% more. Admittedly, we are spending, we are achieving 0.2% more than 1920. Um, but at significant higher cost basis than what other uh, are delivering on. And the argument that the national team have back with us or the pushback and certainly um, the Department of Health and Treasury is it wasn't as though 1920 was the gold standard in the first place to be benchmarking ourselves against. So this is where we really need to be focusing and looking at driving down our expenditure base and delivering more activity within that. Um, this thing comes on, oh, it's a bit small, but on the workforce. So this shows the workforce growth that we've had. So we can see that we are um, spending considerably, considerably more than what we were um, in um, compared to our draft plans are coming in considerably more expensive than 22, 23. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, actually, our workforce growth is reducing at 3,000, although I and specifically around medical and dental. And um, there's a bit of a caveat to that, that some of the workforce plans submitted um, have quite a lot of data quality issues. Um, but when we compare it back to 1920, we still have considerable more WTE in than what we've seen in our 23, 24 plans. And when you consider the efficiencies that are probably being put against payroll, the workforce doesn't quite triangulate. We're not seeing the workforce reductions that we'd be expecting to be able to deliver that productivity that we're being asked for. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, very, very clear. And I think um, there's some real opportunities there, isn't there, to join the top down, you know, expectation nationally of, of really improving productivity, making sure we're delivering some of the key ambitions and then linking that through to um, confidence and assurance that you've actually got the resources and the plans to deliver that. So um, let's pick that up in a moment. I just want to transi transition, if that's OK, to uh, Fiona. And uh, she's just going to pick up the thread on um, the workforce plan. You've heard right the way through all the presentations here, the importance of accuracy in planning for workforce um, from the importance of scheduling, um, the strategic opportunities to connect uh, planning for workforce through to the business, uh, which Nick talked about. And then Francis has returned to that topic in terms of, you know, productivity. So if I can hand over to you, Fiona, you've probably only got about five minutes, if that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Fiona, you're Sorry, on can the... you see the slides? We can. Yes, no. For some reason, it seems to have gone right back to the beginning. I'm not quite sure why. I would just share your slides rather than the Teams one, if that's OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine, Alison. Hang on then. Perhaps you could talk while you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. But it's all right. I'm just technology's getting the better of me. Can you see the slides now? They've disappeared. We off can. My screen. You keep going. Right. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. Um. So, following on from Francis's last comments about um. The workforce. Um, I'd sort of like you to introduce you to some of the models that we've been developing in Arden and Gem around um, strategic workforce planning. I think building on what's been said earlier, we have been working with systems at an integrated care board and an, an STP level for four or five years now to help them look at the baseline of their workforce data and um, and what the picture looks like across the whole system rather than an individual organisation, obviously using Excel. And that has is starting to become very clunky because files are becoming very large. So we've been looking at developing um, through Anaplan um, some models that will help to address this. But a little bit of background that hasn't been covered so far, um, NHS England has issued guidance to um, ICBs around um, their people plan and there are eight specific buckets or pillars of work um, that people are focusing on and we feel that workforce planning can address at least six of those. So we're just going to do a little video demonstration of what um, can be offered in the planning that's been talked about throughout the rest of this morning. I did think I'd just start 
by looking at a schematic of, of what it might look like. Um, we've talked, there's been references throughout around process mapping, business process re-engineering and, and how it helps to make the flow better. So when we're devi devising or developing a model, um, be it for workforce planning, capacity and demand or any other part of the process, we need to agree what data we need, how we're going to structure it, what calculations that we need, and that includes those what, it, what ifs and the scenarios, which are so important in what we're doing at the moment. And then critically, what outputs we want to generate and how they need to be um, prepared. So I'm now going to run the video. Um, so this is the landing page that you see when you go into a model within um, Anaplan. The first page, the landing page shows the types of things that we develop. So it could be the reasons for leaving, it could be organisation, could be area of work. And we're just going to look at reason for leaving. This is something that one of our customers asked us to look at. So in here, we have all the reasons that we give on ESR for leaving, but we can select based on what we're looking at. And in this case, it's retirement. We can select all those reasons that are associated with retirement. And then we can um, actually check that that's what we want and we can enter the admin pages to actually enter the data. So the data that we import into the system for workforce planning is straight from ESR. It's not asking people to develop difficult or complex spreadsheets. It is direct reports based around employee number. So we keep it um, non-identifiable, um, but also keeps it simple from a import and consistency level. We then can look at, oh, I thought it was going to run through, I apologise. Um, it, we look at our retirements specifically, so we can make assumptions. When we look at assumptions for retirements, we can look at where do we want to base our data on. And in this case, we're looking at the 22 financial year. But we can also put in assumptions around retirement about how, what percentage of our population by band, by age are going to retire in any one time. But if we get additional information, we can overwrite the um, the plan to give us more accurate information or to scenario plan if we reduce the retirements by um, two percent what does that do or in the case of the model we've just been looking at if we try to get everyone to work two years longer what impact does that have on the workforce in the long run um, and then we move on to some of our outputs. So we can look at our employee baseline, we can look at what we've got, but we can also predict what we may have in the future and start to look at some of the forecasting methodology. For this, we're looking at levers and retirements. So you can see levers forecast, you can see levers actual, you can see the same for your retirements. That is for the whole um, organisation or the whole system, but you can break it down by individual staff groups. In this case, we're looking at um, medical and dental staffing. Once you've applied it, all your dashboards, all your views change. You don't go back when you change view. You don't go back to something else. So this is now just showing um, the data for medical and dental staff. And then if you go on to a different screen, so your staff in post dashboard, this then shows the whole um, system, but it's showing only medical and dental staff. So you can see your assignments, your acting up, your secondments, that sort of thing. You can also see your headcount um, and a whole breakdown of your staffing within um, 
the dashboard system. You can change the year, you can change however you want to look at it, and you can cut it by system, area, individual organisation, pathway. Um, and that is a very, very, very quick gallop through, Alison, to try and keep within your time frame. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's fine. I think I think just um, a couple of extra points, really, perhaps just to join up the conversation we've been having, really, because I think the key thing that came out to me was that whole system picture you've now got. So you could just imagine how you could use that as a baseline. You've got a sort of baseline understanding of your workforce. What you could do with that, linking it back to the conversation we've just had through the course of this um this seminar really about you know we've got a, a mission around elective recovery so you could overlay that workforce um against that if you could assemble the workforce against departments assemble it to specialty really un understand how that you know how that the retirements could be prevented with the new tax arrangements that are coming in etc etc you could imagine how you'd be able to scenario plan some of that and look at that workforce gap that um uh, Dave Webb talked about before that demand and supply workforce gap. So I don't know if you want a minute on that at all. So that's exactly what we're doing at the moment. So we've been working with systems to look at the baseline for three or four years and to start looking at some of the hotspots in the area, do deep dives into the workforce from that way. And we are able to look at it by pathway, by geography, so place based, um, by um, service and by profession and starting to add in the um, ability to scenario plan and start asking what if has has been quite um it's been a challenge but it's it's actually been really really beneficial we've done some quite interesting stuff around the um retirement planning and we're now starting to look at how we can link capacity and demand with the workforce and um, link that to some of the we've, we've developed a capacity and demand model around outpatients that we can link to the workforce and that would also link to the bed, bed planning stuff that's being done elsewhere as well yeah so it is that scenario planning that makes yeah. this so much better than yeah. having just an excel spreadsheet which tends to not give you that forecasting and that scenario planning ability yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks for that. So I'm just going to finish us off or finish off <laughs> and finish us off uh, with a brief sort of uh, summary about what's next. And we, as I say, we do these um, seminars. We've got one coming up on primary care, uh, which will be on our website in due course. Um, and this, as I say, the topic here has been about integrated planning and connected planning and um, how we connect the population to care design and delivery through clinical stewardship, how we connect it again to resource management. And this is bottom up, top down and sideways in. It's about connecting those together so that you've got an overlay and you can ask questions and you can test assumptions and evidence that's built into this. Um, we want to work with all parts of the NHS, but we are starting and looking at where do we start with this? And we, we're seeking um, early adopters to come and work with us as part of our network. And what we want to make sure is that we build all of these good practice in at the start so um, that we actually think about governance. What does what does the success look like and what does good look like for good governance? How do we make sure that we're building in and working with you on excellent processes that link uh, strategic through to operation? And what does good processes look like? How do you em embed evidence? We've not talked about this, but actually there's an opportunity for us to have pre-built assumptions in here, which means that as you change an assumption, as you change a driver, you can have a baseline set of outputs that will then enable you to uh, test your your plans against and again we've talked a lot about scenario uh, planning but it's actually about dynamic scenario risk management it's not about long-term necessarily scenario plans it's about that dynamic risk assessment so what we would like to do really is to is to build a community of practice we're um, very much going to be opening up our opportunity on our website for colleagues to join uh, and develop this community of practice as we move forward with this project, we'll then develop an opportunity for membership uh, and to work with us on building models and to share models. 
moving from proof of value to accelerator models, which are those that are ready to implement, uh, which will overlay your organisational requirement or system requirement. So just to finish off with that as a sort of time scale, uh, we are now, as we move into April, going to be opening up for the network of interested organisations. We want to build a small group of anchor organisations who will help, help us with this initiative. We think it's a fantastic initiative. Um, look at where to start and what accelerator models we want to commission and then start to go through and mobilise this as a new service. And it's very much a membership service. It's very much membership driven and membership owned. So more on that. If you look out for it on our website or contact me, um, I'd be only too happy to to chat to you about the the concept around that. But um, we've managed to finish on time, which is, which is amazing. And uh, thank you to all my uh, fantastic speakers. I think we've made a really connected presentation, if I can say that. I think we've had a really good some threads really run through the presentation and it's been a pleasure to see you all this morning. Uh, thank you and look out for the materials on our website. Thank you, Alison. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.